All right, so as we are um, waiting for some additional people to come in, I'm going to start by saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining us today, wherever in the world you are. Uh, my name is Carol Cohn, and I'm the director of the Consortium on Gender Security and Human Rights, which is based at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And I am really happy and really excited to be welcoming you to today's webinar on Black Feminist Ecological Perspectives. Um, I'll give you a little bit of information about how this webinar is going to work. It's scheduled to go for two hours. Our three panelists will each offer about 10 minutes of opening remarks. Then we'll have about 45 minutes in which I'll pose several questions for discussion amongst the panelists. Uh, and then we'll turn to audience questions and I will um, turn the Zoom over to the consortium's project manager, Melissa Kay, who will be gathering your questions throughout the webinar. So if you'd like to submit questions, you can do it at any point um, and please use the Q&A function to do that. At the very end, each panelist will have time for a brief closing reflection. And when you, the participants leave the session, you, a, um, a little pop-up survey will appear on your screen and we'd be really grateful if you could take just a couple of minutes to fill it out. A couple of other quick practical things, the webinar is being closed captioned. To turn on closed captioning, you'll see the closed caption option at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can select either show subtitle or view full manuscript transcript. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties with Zoom during the symposium, if you email info at genderandsecurity.org, someone will be there to try to help out. Um, and last thing, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available online at our website and our YouTube channel. Today's webinar is the first in a four part series on the prospects for sustainable peace at the nexus of race, gender, and the climate crisis. All of the webinars look to be wonderful and we hope you'll join us for as many of them as you can. In the chat box, you can find the um, URL for details about the topics, the speakers and their talks, as well as the registration links. I'd like to add that we would not be able to host these panels and these webinars without the generous support of UMass Boston departments and programs that sponsor our talks. For today's panel, our appreciation and thanks go out to the UMass Boston Departments of Africana Studies, Anthropology, Conflict Resolution, Human Security and Global Governance, economics, history, philosophy, political science, and women's gender and sexuality studies, as well as the human rights minor, the Honors College, and the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development. Uh, I'd also like to thank the consortium staff and the terrific interns who've worked so hard to prepare today's event, including Katie Rose Parsons, Lauren Nishimura, and Taylor Douglas. And um, Melissa Kay, our project manager, deserves special and massive thanks not only for today's webinar, but for the whole spring series. She not only dealt with the practical organizing and the logistics, but she deserves the lion's share of the credit for the intellectual work of conceptualizing, researching, and designing the series. So thank you, Melissa. Um, before I give a bit of framing for this webinar and introduce our first panelist, I'd like to take a moment for a land, labor, and life acknowledgement. And the first part of that for me actually has to be an acknowledgement of Sindiso Manisi Weeks, who hails from South Africa and is now a professor at UMass Boston, whose own thoughtful land, labor, and life acknowledgement at our recent symposium on feminist approaches to the climate crisis sparked some rethinking for me about land acknowledgements as did the Northwestern University's um, Native American and Indigenous Initiatives website to which her remark sent so many of us. It's central to our understanding of what the consortium's work is all about to acknowledge the land upon which the University of Massachusetts Boston resides, as well as an honoring of Indigenous people's relationships with their traditional territories and as a recognition of ongoing colonial violence. UMass Boston and its surrounding communities are based on the ancestral homelands of the Massachusetts, Pawtucket, and Nipmuc people. We acknowledge the violent history of genocide and forced removal from this territory and honor the diverse Indian people still connected to this land. We also note that acknowledgments of this type are only one small initial step 
toward building a culture of respect, truth, and accountability. Acknowledgement needs to be followed by gaining more knowledge, by action building solidarity and combating the ongoing structural and physical violence directed toward indigenous peoples. Following Sindiso, I also want to acknowledge that this country, like many others, would not exist if it wasn't for the unpaid enslaved labor of black and brown people. And so I want to honor the legacy of the African diaspora and black life knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. Finally, especially in this time of pandemic, I also want to honor the waves of immigrants, including my own grandparents, who came and still come to this country as a free, if desperate, choice, when violence, poverty, and marginalization in their home countries left them little other choice. And I want to acknowledge the ways in which they're carrying labor, both paid and unpaid, and their essential labor everywhere from agricultural fields to grocery stores to hospitals make our lives possible. Now, to situate this webinar conceptually, Today's webinar and the rest of the spring webinar series are part of the consortium's feminist roadmap for sustainable peace and a sustainable planet project. In particular, they're a direct follow-up to the three-day symposium we held in October of 2020 on confronting the climate crisis, feminist pathways to just and sustainable futures. And if you missed it, you can still find it on our website and YouTube. The panels were fabulous. I hope you'll check it out. Um, it was a central premise of that symposium and of the Feminist Roadmap Project more generally that we will not be able to effectively address the climate crisis by looking for solutions that are rooted in the same political economic paradigms, relationships, and worldviews that created the current climate and ecological crises in the first place. Those approaches often not only pose great environmental risks themselves, but all also threatened to gravely deepen existing inequalities within and between nations. And they simply don't offer and aren't based on the kinds of deep transformations in our approach to the planet we live on that the scale and urgency of these crises demand. Luckily for us and for the rest of the planet's creatures, the dominant paradigms, worldviews, and forms of knowledge that brought us to this brink of eco-catastrophe are not the only ones that exist. Rooted in intersectional feminist epistemological perspectives, we know that all knowledge is situated knowledge. No one has a monopoly on the right, the realistic, the accurate way to see the world. And the differently situated people have um, not only different views, but know different things. The colonizer and the colonized need to know different things in order to survive because of the power relations between them. And we know that what counts as knowledge depends on what you're trying to accomplish. That is, what counts as knowledge, the kinds of knowledge you develop are not only based on where you're situated, they're also based on what you're trying to do. The knowledge and belief systems you need if you're trying to live in a mutually protective, restorative, interdependent relation to the natural world is not the same knowledge you need if your goal is to manipulate, dominate, extract, to bend the natural world to your will. The kinds of knowledge and belief systems you need if your goal is to live in relationships of respect and equality across differences between people is different than the kinds of knowledge and belief systems you need if your goal is to dominate, to exercise power over others. So we have these very different forms of knowledge developed by diverse communities situated differently within multiple axes of power relations. Most of those forms of knowledge, especially those developed by marginalized and subordinated groups, have not been recognized as knowledge in the dominant culture. They've been systematically erased and delegitimated. But we are at a historical juncture in which our futures depend on lifting up, making more visible, and centering exactly those marginalized knowledges, value systems, and worldviews that have been developed by those groups who have been most marginalized including women, indigenous people, black people, people of color, and those communities whose practices have for generations been based in living sustainably within ecosystems. So we understand this webinar series and today's webinar itself as a part of that process. It is a great privilege for us to host today's webinar to have these speakers who are all spectacular. And I will start by introducing our first speaker and then come in um, with the next ones and introduce each of them when it's their time to speak. So our first panelist today is Dr. Keisha Anamishan Ducree. 
She's the inaugural Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and former chair and associate professor in African, um, African American Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences at Syracuse University. She's authored works on environmental justice, feminism and community-based research, including the 2012 book, A Place We Call Home, Gender, Race and Justice in Syracuse. And in 2016, a co-edited volume entitled Addressing Environmental and Food Justice Toward Dismantling the School to Prison Pipeline, Poisoning and Imprisoning Youth. Her most recent scholarship on this subject has just been published in the 2018 special edition of Environmental Sociology entitled The Black Feminist Spatial Imagination and an Intersectional Environmental Justice. She's also curated photography exhibitions based on her community-based arts research known as Photo Voice in New York, California, and Trinidad and Tobago. In 2011, she was Fulbright Professor, Fulbright Fellow at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine. She's been a committed advocate for environmental justice for over two decades. Her first foray in environmental activism was as a toxic, toxics campaigner for Greenpeace USA in the 1990s. She combines her experiences on the front lines of the environmental justice movement and academic training in geography and demography for a unique and gendered perspective on economic and environmental inequality. Her latest writing project is the development of a book manuscript that expands upon her theoretical perspectives on the black feminist spatial imagination, featuring case studies of the lives and influences of three women of the African diaspora, Harriet Tubman, Wangari Matai, and Jamaica Kincaid, and that is where she will be starting us off. So it is with great excitement that I turn to you. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, and thank you to all who have organized um, this, um, this symposium tonight. Um, and so I am going to try to take all my thoughts um, and present them in 10 minutes um, and hopefully leave you with a lot of questions afterwards. So the title of my talk is Harriet Tubman is dope and she is dope. She really <laughs> is. And the, but the problem is the way that the mainstream imagination has about Harriet Tubman, I should say that yesterday was Harriet Tubman Day. Um, she died March 10th. Um, and so um, the way that we think about Tubman is we think about her as Moses or conductor of the Underground Railroad. But I'm here to tell you that this conceptualization that I have that I've been using called the Black Feminist Spatial Imagination explains why Harriet Tubman is not only dope for that, but her mastery of space prepared her to be able to do what she did to free 300 formerly enslaved people, mostly her relatives. And we also, un we also need to understand that she's dope for the work that she's not is recognized for in terms of being a spy involved in the largest um, raid during the Civil War, as well as her work in abolitionism and support of others, um, as well as in her final years, establishing a space for um, orphans and for Black elderly in Auburn, New York. So that's why she's dope. So I'm going to talk about the Underground Railroad piece, but there's so much more to this. And the key to this in the book manuscript that was alluded to is I have needed to create a conceptualization for what I saw in my photo voice research with women in the Syracuse, Black mothers in South side of Syracuse, an impoverished area right next to Syracuse University, and to with um, women who lived in um, stigmatized neighborhoods around the capital city port of Spain and Trinidad and Tobago. I noticed with my research and with these uh, particular women and mothers that they understood environmental risk to be much broader than anything that was ecological, that their risk, what they saw as ecological risk had to do with uh, the threat of violence, the site of past violence due to drug trafficking or gang activity. Um, and so they have a very broader understanding of what environment is and what risk is. And so coming through that research, what was available to me to explain that wasn't enough because it was something about being a woman and it was something about being uh, um, African-American, African-descended that 
needed to explain what was going on and how they understood and managed risk in their communities. For the rest of us, those who are able, if they live in a risky environment, they go, they move. But those who are stuck in those spaces have to find unique strategies to mitigate those risks. And that's what I ended up calling the Black feminist spatial imagination. And it's really this idea that um, having this intersectional position, um, having the challenges of patriarchy and having the challenges um, of racism requires a hypervigilance and a watchfulness when Black women move through space, right? Um, and so Harriet Tubman, I think, is really iconic when it comes to the idea of a Black woman being hypervigilant and watchful and moving through space. In her, again, her mastery of space is what makes her so dope. So I want to talk about the ways in which her mastery of space, those spaces, their command of her spaces, make sense in this idea of the Black feminist spatial imagination. The first is her understanding um, of plantation landscapes. There's a particular, she has a unique location in her personal history and her biography that made it possible for her to have the agency and the courage and the will to run away and to return for others. There's also the idea of fugitive landscapes in her work on fugitive landscapes. So she settles in Auburn, New York, and she settles at the behest of, of, of the Seward family. But it is something about the actual position of Auburn, New York, I think that is important. The third thing about her master of space and why she's so dope is that um, she has been in recent literature, particularly by Dorsita Taylor, she has been placed among the canon of environmental philosophers like um, Thoreau and Muir. And um, Dorsita Taylor has an excellent chapter called Harriet in the Wilds that really explains her mastery and understanding of nature and ecology. She understands the medicinal herbs and plants, um, things that we, we haven't really talked about as her, as her being sitting beside this canon of environmental philosophers. Then if time allows, <laughs> I'll know if Melissa tells me, there's also this ability of this mastery of space in her role as a spy. When she worked for, um, when she worked for the government in uh, the Civil War and her successful spy craft in the, in the Combahee River raid. And we know the Combahee River because of its significance in the establishment of, of, of Black feminist genealogy with the Combahee River a Collective Statement and, and Barbara Smith and others. And then finally, in her final years, she's able to provide space for others. As I said before, she moves to Auburn, she settles there, and she takes her capital. She's well known. She takes her capital and she she decides to fundraise and, and take charitable donations to build a home for the aged and for Black orphans. So she never stops um, and she's always working and it's all is about her command and mastery and strategy of space. So let me go back to plantation landscapes really quickly. One of the things that people don't know, see, four minutes left, I'm glad I gave it all to you. So if you have a question, you can ask me about plantation spaces, fugitive landscapes, her environmental philosophy, spycraft in the Cumbahee River raid, as well as her final establishment of these homes. So what people don't realize is that um, Harriet Tubman was uniquely situated to be to, to run away because of her mastery of plantation landscapes. Her and her father were leased out to other families and other farms in Dorchester, Maryland. So she did not have the same geographical understanding as someone, as an enslaved person who didn't was not leased and never left uh, the um, plantation grounds. Because her father and her were they were moving to different places, she had a larger geographical map and understood Dorchester, Maryland better than the average enslaved person. Her father was into the timber industry, and so he taught her, this part of the environmental philosopher that Dorsita talks about, he taught her about the plants and the woods and reverence for nature. She understood um, how to move through the woods and space and felt quite comfortable there. So these types of things that she was primed for made it possible for her to attempt to escape with her brothers the first time. They were captured, but then she did it again on 
on her own herself. And as we know, as the story is told, she goes back multiple times until she um, is able to liberate 300 enslaved people. I also want to take this time to talk about the fugitive landscape. So again, she settles in Auburn, New York. And while she settles there because of the generosity of the sewers, she also settles there. I now that I look at it, it's not that far from Canada. And so after the Fugitive Slave Act, she knew that it was dangerous for her to be there. So she went, she took her parents and herself and they went to St. Catharines in Ontario, Canada, not very far. So now we have Harriet not only dominating a mastery of, the Uni of, of space from the South, because um, Maryland is South, um, to the North, we have her mastery and domination over transnational boundaries, right? And she's able to cross to Canada and to the New York and the US in ways to make herself safe and her others um, in her care safe. And again, environmental philosophy, um, we can definitely talk about that and, and what um, she knew about the woods and her, her um, experiences as a healer. Um, and then the interesting thing about the Combahee River raid is while she was instrumental in the most successful raid um, in the Civil War, um, as many people will talk about when it comes to Black feminism and Black feminist epistemology, her value was always threatened. She fought after the war to get her pension like other former soldiers that the United States would not offer her. When they eventually did give her her pension, what she was owed for her work during the war, it was significantly less than other soldiers. Um, so we can talk about Harriet in terms of um, the devaluing of, of Black women um, in the capitalist system. And then again, finally, the idea of space. Um, on her grounds in Auburn, New York, I invite you all to come visit. Um, it has now been declared a, a national a historic site. Um, she has the remains, it burned down, she has the remains of the age at home where she helped um, before there was Medicare, Medicaid, um, uh, she saw fit to, uh, to um, protect the most vulnerable in um, Black society, which were children without parents as well as the aged. So again, Harriet is dope. Oh, thank you so much for that talk. You packed a tremendous amount into a very short time. Um, and, you know, thank you for giving us not only an, a, a re-understanding of Harriet Tubman, but also this idea of feminist black spatial imagination and multiple ways of thinking about mastery of space. Um, and I have to say, starting us with even this idea about a, expanding the idea of environmental risk and such a clear example of when you ask different people about even a concept that some people think of as so straightforward, so cut and dried, your entire understanding of that concept changes. Um, and finally, thank you for the title, Harriet Tubman is dope. We're all gonna remember it and think about, <laughs> and think about everything you said in relation to it. Um, so thank you so much. Um, it's now my honor to introduce our second panelist. I realized I forgot to put my video back on. I'm sorry. Um, there we go. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Taya Miles. She taught on the faculty of the University of Michigan for 16 years and is currently professor of history and radical alumni professor at Harvard University. Her work has been recognized and supported by the MacArthur Foundation. And yes, she is indeed a winner of the fabled so-called MacArthur Genius Award, um, as well as the Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She's the author of three multiply prize winning books in the history of American slavery. Give me one second to fix my screen. Um, including The Dawn of Detroit, A Chronicle of Slavery and Freedom in the City of the Straits and the, tie that bind, and the Ties that Bind. Sorry, that was In the City of the Straits and the Ties that Bind, the story of, an, those are two different books. I'm running this together. Um, the Ties and The Ties that Bind, the story of an Afro-Cherokee family in slavery and freedom. And her work has been notable for its boundary crossing in its complex, fine-grained, insightful explorations of the relationships between African and Cherokee people living in colonial America. 
She's also published historical fiction set on a plantation and a travel narrative about her visits to haunted historic sites of the South, as well as various articles and op-eds in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, CNN, the Huffington Post on women's history, public history, black public culture, and black and indigenous interrelated experience. Her new book, All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, A Black Family Keepsake is forthcoming from Random House in 2021 this year. Um, she has become over time increasingly engaged in environmental humanities questions and the ways of articulating and enlivening African-American environmental consciousness. In addition to her research, scholarship and popular writing, she's also director of Eco Girls, Environmental and Cultural Opportunities for Girls in Urban Southeast Michigan, an organization she founded in 2011, whose mission is to reach girls of color and girls in economically challenged areas whose neighborhoods too often become depositories for environmental waste, but whose communities are left out of strategic planning for a future that will be affected by resource depletion and global climate change. Eco Girls simultaneously encourages cultural production as an alternative for a consumption culture and fosters ecological awareness and critical environmental thinking, teaching girls to put ideas of environmental justice to work. So it is a great pleasure for me to turn the floor over to her um, for her talk on black women and the nature of fugitivity. Thank you very much for that introduction, Carol. And thank you to Melissa and Carol and everyone for organizing this. Um, I have to begin by offering just a few quick corrections. Uh, the first is that um, I am a Radcliffe alumni professor, not the radical <laughs> alumni professor, which I say partly because I don't deserve that mantle, but somebody who does is Dr. Cornel West, who I am so distressed to, um, to know uh, will be leaving Harvard University. I, I think that that is deeply, deeply unfortunate development for this institution. And I also want to add that Eco Girls is no longer an active project. I closed that project when I moved to the Northeast uh, in large part because that was a locally based project. But we shall see if it can be revived. It's always on my mind. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited, in fact, I think I might probably start to talk over my time because this isn't even my topic yet. But I love the presentation that we just heard from Kishi, if I pronounced her name correctly, I hope I did, about Harriet Tubman. Um, it was very inspiring. And it, it, it's funny because the person who actually got me thinking in this direction is, of course, Dr. Dorsita Taylor. I heard her make a comment many years ago at a, at a symposium at African American Studies at the University of Michigan about how Harriet Tubman was an environmentalist. And that was the first time the idea had crossed my mind. And her comment just changed everything that I was thinking about. So I'm very glad that we are in the company of Harriet Tubman and uh, Dorsita Taylor. And I'm looking forward to our discussion that will follow. So my very brief presentation is titled Black Women and the Nature of Fugitivity. And this presentation was actually inspired by a Black feminist environmental retreat that took place about four years ago at the University of Michigan. It was a retreat that we actually planned in relationship to the Eco Girls Project, because one of the things that we as organizers realized about Eco Girls was that we were doing programming for girls, for basically middle, middle school age girls into uh, the, the younger high school years. And we were doing uh, weekend programming. We ended up developing a summer camp, which was really wonderful. We took the girls up to Northern Michigan and we hung out by a, a lake and did all kinds of creative things. And yet the staff who were working on that project, who mostly consisted of undergraduate students, graduate students, um, recent graduates, also staff members at the university, of, at the university and volunteers. The staff uh, of the Eco Girls Project were not really having the same opportunity to engage one another around ideas of environment. And we kind of stumbled across this in a meeting that we had, a very long meeting, where we just, those of us gathered around the table, 
started talking about our own environmental stories and what it was like to grow up in certain places and our memories and what they meant to us. And that was one of the best things that we ever did as Eco Girls, actually. Just that staff meeting where we talked about uh, nature, the environment, about place in our lives and what it meant to us. And so out of that experience, we decided to develop a retreat for adults on um, Black feminist environmental consciousness. And so that retreat was organized by um, Eco Girls staff members, which included uh, Elizabeth James, who is a professional storyteller and also a coordinator in African American Studies at Michigan, and Tamara Butler, who is a professor of uh, literature, literary studies at, at Michigan State. And we came together and we provided uh, the people who, who came to the event with a number of questions to think about. And we also had a keynote talk by Dr. Lorette Savoy, a geologist and a, a beautiful environmental writer who has a book called Trace that I urge everyone to read. It's just gorgeous, very lyrical, all about her experiences growing up and her researches into place and the meaning of place and memory and erasure. And we put forward some guiding questions for the discussion. And one of those questions was, who are our intellectual forebears and models? And what are their most compelling ideas and messages for our work? And what are their aims and techniques? We already in this conversation so far have some forebears and models that we are thinking of and holding in mind. And I want to add to that with some ways that I have begun to answer that question in my own work with thinking about 19th century Black women writers and their attention to environment. And so I'm going to see, a, see how far I can get with um, reading a bit of my most recent writing, not, not published yet in draft form, about one of those writers until Melissa gives me the time to start winding down. She fled and with her children all, she reached the stream and crossed it o'er. Bright visions of deliverance came like dreams of plenty to the poor. This is a stanza from Frances Ellen Watkin Harper's poem titled The Slave Mother, Tale of the Ohio and published in 1857. Frances E.W. Harper is one of those figures who I've been thinking quite a lot about. And this poem is one that she wrote in reaction to the case of Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner, who many of us know was a young woman enslaved in Kentucky who was held in um, sexual bondage by her, her owner and who already had children, multiple children by the time she was in her early 20s. And she and her husband decided that they were going to try to escape across the Ohio River to Ohio with their children and with their parents. And this is the factual story that inspired Toni Morrison to write her novel, Beloved. And what happened in the Margaret Garner case is that once the family actually made it across the Ohio River, by crossing the river when it was frozen, they made their way to a cut to a free cousin of the family and uh, their, uh, the owner of Margaret Garner and the children, Archibald Gaines, actually found them in the cabin along with other armed men um, and they were empowered to bring them back by force because of the Fugitive Slave Act that had been passed in 1850. And so um, in that cabin unfolded the scene that many of us are familiar with, a very tragic scene of Margaret Garner making the decision that, um, and she's reportedly said this, quote, before my children shall be taken back to slavery, I will kill every one of them. So she began to um, assault her children and, and she did uh, take the life of her toddler daughter uh, who she was hoping to send to a better place. So soon after this episode occurred, the Philadelphia-based African-American feminist writer, Frances E.W. Harper, composed what was likely the first literary account of the event. And her poem, The Slave Mother, A Tale of the Ohio, features an enslaved mother fleeing across the frozen river. And she does so, according to Harper's language, 
to free those children from, quote, a darkly threatened doom. Now, in her writing about this event, Harper uh, uses lyricism, she uses uh, features of the natural world, and she emphasizes the presence and also the, the contribution, the, the active involvement of features of the landscape. She talks about water, she talks about the weather, she talks about the trees, she talks about the sky, and she makes them not only a backdrop, but also um, figures, actors in the story. And it strikes me as someone who has been interested in environmental history and who is trying to learn more about that field and, and to begin to write in that field, that this is exactly what environmental historians say that um, they want to do. That is to recognize nature as not just context, but as a historical actor. And I think that Herbert does this in her poem when she tries to understand and represent what Margaret Garner was experiencing. So to read you a few lines um, from Harper's poem, she begins by saying, winter and night were on the earth. So that's her, her, her setting for what's going to occur. And she personifies the terrain by talking about uh, the shivering trees that feebly moan and the breeze that murmurs and uh, the season itself, which is winter, that size. It's all these elements of nature are with the enslaved mother. They are her companions. They are as cold and isolated and desperate as she is in this moment. And Harper captures all that in this poem. She describes the ice bridge that the Ohio River has transformed into, which is the only vehicle of Garner's escape. And we get through the poem the sense of just a flash just a flash of the possibility of freedom that nature makes possible before everything closes down because of the men with guns who come to the cabin. So through Harper's work, we grasp more feelingly the encasing nature of slavery, the environmental quality of captivity, and the narrative capacity of things to illuminate the interior lives of the marginalized. We get to see inside of Garner's experience by way of Harper's writing and the way that Harper uses the elements of nature to tell and to enliven Garner's story. So my thought is that if we were to sit with Black feminist women's remembrances and narrations of historical trauma, that we would see not only unconscionable loss, but we would also see enslaved women finding in their fragile environments the tools of material resistance the sources of emotional sustenance. And we would also see something that we can borrow for ourselves in the present day, and that is a language for expressing the unspeakable and a language for inspiring the fight against slavery, against racialized violence, against patriarchy. I'm gonna stop there because although I have about uh, two more pages I'd love to share with you, Melissa has told me that I am at time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that really, uh, for that presentation, which itself was so beautiful and lyrical and so inspiring in so many ways, including, uh, I think, first of all, your historian's magic of recouping histories that we've been told don't exist. Um, and in, um, it's so interesting to me the ways in which what you're part of what you're looking at here is um, seeing agency in nature, seeing um, nature as a neighbor, as a companion, as an actor, um, as providing not only the tools of material resistance, but also sources of sustenance and inspiration for social justice fights. And I, it, um, it, it, not exactly the same as, but resonating so clearly with some indigenous perspectives um, that we, and uh, speakers who we had in the symposium and, um, and again, so mind opening around how we need to be thinking about environmental issues, can be thinking about environmental issues and the natural environment so differently. So thank you so much. 
Um, our final panelist, um, I'll now turn to, that's Frances Roberts Gregory. She's an eco-womanist ethnographer and feminist political ecologist. Her feminist activist research explores how Gulf Coast Black and Indigenous women navigate contradictory relationships with energy and petrochemical industries, resist environmental racism, and devise solutions for environmental energy and climate justice. She currently serves as a future faculty fellow at Northeastern University in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs and is a proud alum of Spelman College. Um, she is likewise a proud Switzer Environmental Fellow, Ford Predoctoral Fellow, NSF Graduate Research Fellow, Gates Millennium Scholar, and former Environmental Fellow with the Environmental Grantmakers Association. She's also um, an activist, a co-founding member of the Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal, former environmental educator in the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, and a former resource de developer for the New Orleans and C40 Women for Climate Mentorship Program. And I think it's important to say also that uh, her work, um, not only with the Feminist Agenda for Green New Deal and these other, well, and all of these other organizations, I think has been absolutely inspirational and empowering to many younger women of color who are moving into being incredibly important activists and thinkers in this area. So we all need to appreciate her for that as well. Uh, I'd also say for the graduate students who are out there, her participatory action research, I think is really a model of what it means to do work that is uh, politically responsible, informed, careful, sensitive to and responsive to issues of power imbalances, not just in research in general, but especially in working with marginalized communities, um, as well as just being totally fascinating. So again, it is really my great pleasure to welcome her to be part of today's panel, and I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Carol, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And so, as Carol mentioned, uh, my name is Frances Roberts Gregory. I'm a future faculty fellow in the School of Public Policy Urban Affairs at Northeastern. And I'm really excited to share with you some of my eco memories from my fieldwork uh, season in uh, Gulf Coast, Louisiana. And so, I have some slides. Hopefully, I'll be able to. Let's see. Ah, yes. So I always like to start off with a land acknowledgement. So I'm currently based in uh, Gulf Coast, Louisiana, particularly New Orleans, which also goes by Bobancha. Bobancha is a Choctaw word, which means land or place of many tongues. And it's historically home to many indigenous peoples, including the Chittimacha, the Choctaw, the Atakapa, the Homa, the Natchez, the Tunica, and many other individuals. I would also say it's uh, currently home to many uh, uh, African diasporic Caribbean um, folk, displaced indigenous folk from the African diaspora. So a little bit about me. So I am a daughter, or I should say granddaughter, great granddaughter of the great migration. Uh, I was born in New Jersey, although I have uh, personal family ties to three environmental justice communities um, in New Jersey, North Carolina, as well as Augusta, Georgia. Uh, and I actually uh, studied in Atlanta, Georgia, and was able to complete my doctoral studies in California in the Bay Area. And currently, as I mentioned, reside in Louisiana. And this is really important because as a eco-womanist ethnographer and auto-ethnographer, I really situate my Black feminist standpoint in my research. And the fact that I have these personal ties to these different environmental justice geographies inspire my current feminist activism. So let's talk a little bit about Black feminist ecological thought. Uh, Black feminist eco ecological thought has a long and varied history. Up here pictured are just um, some examples of scholarship produced by uh, uh, Black women who really inspire me. And I think it's really important to understand that Black feminist ecological thought uh, 
is diasporic. It's also transnational it's interdisciplinary. So we can talk about folk in the humanities and social sciences, but also folk in STEM fields and folk who perhaps don't have an academic affiliation, but are really uh, passionate about the relationship between uh, Black women, or I should say um, Black communities in the earth. Um, also folk who are, who are involved in queer ecologies and even Black women um, who are agrarian thinkers, folk who are thinking about our relationship to um, uh, rural and urban agriculture. So when we talk about Black women's relationships to land, to, uh, to space, to ecologies, there's many common commonalities as well as points of departure. So many Black feminist ecological thinkers uh, focus on the need to disrupt nature culture binaries. Uh, they, as I mentioned all, uh, earlier, they draw from interdisciplinary sources. They also focus on spirit and indigeneity and thinking about indigeneity from a North American context as well as an African diasporic context. They center kin, uh, they trouble stereotypes that unfortunately cast Black women as anti-environmentalists or having ambivalence towards engagement with wilderness. And also they focus on the sacredness of the Black woman's body, particularly folk who identify as eco-womanist theologians. Now, when we talk about points of departure, uh, I would say different Black feminist ecological thinkers uh, discuss the explicit and superficial link between the oppression of women and domination of nature. And what this really refers to is this idea of the double subordination thesis. And so I would say Black feminists, Black women who are ecological thinkers um, have different understandings of how the domination of, of nature, if we want to even call it that, relates to the domination of, of Black women and Black families. Also, I would say Black ecological thinkers, uh, feminist thinkers, um, have differing understandings of what does it means to have an earth as mother metaphor, and also whether or not uh, women's caretaking role is oppressive or liberatory. Finally, I would say that many Black feminist ecological thinkers, as mentioned by my, uh, my, the earlier panelists, focus on the need for abolitionist, um, fugitive, and emergent uh, futures. And also they focus on the need for collective care and what uh, some folk, particularly in a Black Southern tradition, call healing justice, or this idea that healing or self-care is actually earth care. Now let's talk more about environmental justice, environmental racism, because I do identify as an environmental justice scholar. So as you may or may not know, Black women have always taken leading roles in the environmental justice movement from its origin days. And there's many different origin stories or tributaries of the environmental justice movement, but I wanna focus uh, a bit on the role of Black faith-based communities, Black church women who have always protested environmental racism. Here we can see, I have pictured um, some folk who are, I would say, challenging the, situ the siting of Black communities, Black families, Black homes, and Superfund sites on toxic landscapes, so, such as folk uh, advocating for Gordon Plaza, fully funded relocation for Gordon Plaza, and also folk who, who are a part of the Coalition Against Death Alley, who are focusing on petrochemical and plantation landscapes. Now, as an eco-womanist, I am greatly inspired by Reverend Dr. Melanie Harris, who um, wrote an amazing, um, just an amazing uh, book, I would call it Eco-Womanism. And really, eco-womanism refers to this idea that uh, Black women, women of color, women of the, of the South, women of the global South, have amazing innovative solutions for environmental issues, for climate change. However, our understanding of or I say our futurist imaginings, our liberatory solutions are not always uh, acknowledged in the mainstream media. They're not always acknowledged in environmental decision-making and natural resource management. So we really need to center our perspectives if we want to address some of these wicked environmental issues. 
Now, as an eco-womanist, I'm also influenced by feminist activist ethnographers. And I'm actually, I would say, developing my own understanding of eco-womanist autoethnography. And really, feminist activist autoethnography is a disruptive and experimental practice. Um, it embraces insider and outsider ethnography in the, in the tradition of Black feminist anthropology. And also, um, it's a vulnerable writing, self-reflexive writing practice. So for my fieldwork season, I really focused on three research questions. How do Gulf Coast women of color, Black and Indigenous women, I should say, navigate contradictory relationships with energy and petrochemical industries? How do Black and Indigenous women resist environmental racism and state corporate crime? And then how do they imagine solutions for environmental energy and climate justice? And once again, I applied uh, Harris's eco-womanist and I would also say Afrofuturist methodology um, during my fieldwork season. And she really uh, advocates for seven interchangeable steps, what she calls spiral methodology. And I actually have a great, uh, uh, publication about how to utilize spiral methodology, but really it's this idea that of praxis, which is a part, a key tenet, I would say, of Black feminist thinking. And so for my particular research, I uh, conducted in-depth and conversational interviews with over 50 Black and Indigenous women. These uh, almost bordered on, uh, I would say, oral histories because they were very long, but you know, folk in the South love to talk and um, it's really important to center these voices. Also, I conducted participant observation as a project manager at the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice and also um, documented my evolution into a climate activist, environmental educator and digital storyteller using, um, I would say the tenets of autoethnography. And so 2017, I began my fieldwork season um, I was actually able to attend the People's Climate Movement March in DC and witness Black and Indigenous women leading these conversations around environmental and climate justice. Also during my field work season, I was able to uh, meet, become friends with, and also just was greatly inspired by many Black and Indigenous women who are really fighting for their lives and fighting, not only fighting for current generations, but future generations. And I would say interspecies justice. These include folk involved, once again, with the Coalition Against Death, Allergy, Death Alley, folk involved in, um, who are advocating for fully funded relocation for Gordon Plaza, folk with the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, and also folk involved in the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. So as a eco womanist ethnographer, I really wanna focus on youth engagement and environmental curriculum, because when we talk about black feminist uh, ecological thought, we're really talking about intergenerational activism, which means we're talking about youth activism. And so many black and indigenous women in Louisiana Gulf South are involved in devising environmental curriculum, engaging youth in green infrastructure projects, I would say summer camps around food justice and urban agriculture, and even um, engaging youth in environmentally themed high schools and courses, which is important because there aren't actually a lot of courses um, in the United States um, it's, I should say it's not actually nationally legislated that in climate justice, environmental justice, energy justice uh, are, re are required to be in K through 12 curriculum. So this is actually really innovative. We also have folk who are involved, or I should say engaging youth around uh, transportation justice, housing justice, um, even youth activism, um, and lawsuits. So it's, there's a lot of work going on on the ground. And so here I just have some pictures from one of my Instagram accounts for my students where they were actually uh, critically engaging the built environment and increasing their critical landscape literacy. And here you have some of my students talking about how environmental justice looks like the dumping of tires in New Orleans East, also uh, the houses that have not, the lack of affordable housing due to disaster capitalism and uh, I would say gentrification post Hurricane Katrina and just the lack of um, healthy food options in certain neighborhoods. And so I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I just want to, I guess, uh, close by talking about 
uh, how I was transformed by uh, feminist activist research and eco-womanist research through civic engagement. And so I actually, as an environmental educator, consider myself to be an activist. I see uh, environmental consciousness raising uh, in the classroom is in, in and outside of the classroom is extremely important. And so many of my students, um, I engage them through um, green infrastructure projects, also by taking students to uh, museums focused on Hurricane Katrina, visiting um, uh, geoscience departments at Jackson State University to increase representation in, um, in STEM, and then also just having students engage in planting, um, which was really fun, I would say. And so currently, sorry, oh. can I just cut in right here. I definitely want us to return to a feminist agenda for a Green New Deal, but maybe after we go through a couple of the panel questions and then come back to the Q&A, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry I went over time, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to talk more about my role as a co-founder of the Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that really rich presentation, um, including it, the, your exploration of the many different meanings and many different types of um, Black feminist ecological thought and activism was really revealing. And then the ways in which you brought in for us kind of methodological reflection, both on research and on activism and on the way the two meet, I think was um, really important and inspiring for many of us. And, um, and clearly we kind of then begin to see this genealogical line from Harriet Tubman on through a lot of the parts of the conversation that you were ending with. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, each one of these presentations was so rich. I know that people are going to want to um, ask our speakers about their presentations. I'm just going to ask you um, with those questions to put them into the Q&A and also to hold off briefly while we go ahead and um, have a few rounds of questions that are not directly um, about each presentation. Um, and we will try to do three or four of them, maybe thinking about, um, you know, less than 10 minutes for each question in terms of helping you gauge um, what kind of response you wanna give. Um, and I guess it may be that we can come close to going past the first one. The first one, but not entirely. The first one was what do you want people to understand about black feminist ecological thinking? And I think that um, it wasn't a question meant to ask any of you to give the definitive answer. We know that doesn't exist. And also Francis has just given us a really expansive view of what kinds of um, ideas and work are included in that thought. So, so the question is really then a more personal one to you. We're talking about a world in which this kind of knowledge is um, often marginalized, barely visible. What is it that when you think about it, um, what are the kinds of ideas that you really want to be much more centered and visible in sort of public imagination and in people's understanding of the possibilities of ecological thought. Um, so, uh, Keisha, can I turn to you first? Sorry. Um, so you're saying, how do we conceptualize feminist ecological thought? Um, for me, um, you started when you started the, the panel itself, but for me, it's about epist uh, the epistemologies, right? And the idea that um, the idea of epistemologies and Black feminist epistemology allows for it to stand on its own. And if you characterize your frame of reference for Black pessimist of black feminist epistemology, then you understand that you can question and interrogate what we have been given as the historical record. So the victors write the historical record. Um, and so black feminist epistemologies allow you to center black women's experiences and the historical legacies of both racism and patriarchy to interrogate what we are supposed to know. 
Um, and so I think that's probably the important thing. It gives us the space, the expansion to, to critically interrogate what has been fed to us and how we understand our social order. Thank you. Taya, do you wanna jump in next? Sure. I will um, just piggyback on that point and add one more to it. And the piggybacking comment I'd make is we are talking about a tradition. And this is something that has, uh, has been argued about Black women's literature, about African-American literature. It always has to be argued that we're not just talking about one-off ideas or random thoughts, but, but rather um, deeply considered, long-standing, and acted in the world traditions. And we, we trace that tradition back to Tubman in this conversation, and we can keep tracing back. It goes back, I am sure, as long as we can know anything about Black women in what is now the United States, and of course, in our homelands before we were brought to what is now the United States. The comment that I'll add to that one is, for me, the integrative quality or character of Black feminist ecological thought is central. And that comes up in what Francis talked about. Um, it comes up in, in the term eco-womanism, that term conjures that. And uh, in the retreat that I mentioned earlier, we had a discussion about what term would we want to use? What term would we prefer? Would it be Black eco-feminism, Black environmental feminism, eco-womanism, Black eco-womanism? We had all these ideas. And um, while, of course, people are going to differ on what they want to be called and how they want to identify, and many people will wear different hats on different days, eco-womanism was the hands-down um, favorite for that group because people trace that idea, people at our retreat trace that idea back to Alice Walker, and Francis has added another thinker you know, to, to, um, to Walker for us to consider as well. And people at the retreat were thinking about the importance of Walker's definition of womanism as being holistic, integrative, multiple, connective, and not just about one particular subgroup's uh, needs. Thank you. We had a similar conversation in figuring out how to name this webinar, which I won't go into, but definitely all of those issues, uh, in, including in the, in the symposium, of course, we had Ruth Nyambura, who is an African ecofeminist, and were there even were there ways to be able to include that perspective in this as well? Anyway, let me turn to Francis. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, especially when we talk about naming, that's that's a whole nother conversation. I would say what I would want to bring to the bring to the conversation is the idea that um, Black feminist ecological thought as is, is once again um, heterogeneous. Um, it's also, for me, really important to focus on how it's diasporic uh, and also it's, uh, it's radical. I would say it's, it's pushing the boundaries. It's on the margins oftentimes, but it's pushing the boundaries of many disciplines, many even, I would say, activists and organizing communities. Uh, and then I would say that it's, it's digital. I think that we have sometimes narrow understandings of what ecologies are, but we need to focus on um, cyber feminisms, digital feminisms, um, folk who are thinking about ecologies and networks in very interesting ways. So yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, Keisha, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I um I wanted to lift up what uh, Frances said earlier in her presentation about praxis and how Black feminist epistemologies allow for a praxis. Um, I uh, in my 2012 book, I was so nervous because I made my voice heard in the narrative, and I was not trained to do that <laughs> as a sociologist. Um, and so, praxis is very important. Um, when you think about the Black feminist ecological perspective. Great, thank you. So I think that your comments um, 
lead me to jump to my third question rather than my second one um, next, because you're talking about um, you know, a, a heterogeneous diasporic ways of thinking that are radical, that push boundaries and allow for praxis. All of this is a world away from what we usually think of when we say, oh, come up with policy recommendations, right? Translate the perspectives that you are bringing into the world of policy and politics. And very often trying to do that is um, excruciating because it's often very hard to bring such radical ways of thinking into a policy frame. And yet, um, if we want to change what's happening in the world at times, that feels really necessary. It feels necessary to try to do that in relation to policy. Um, so the question is, what policy priorities would the Biden-Harris administration have if it were guided by Black feminist ecological thinking? How do you make that leap? Who would like to go first? I, I guess I could start off really quick. I have some very, uh, very brief ideas. I think that since I think that from a black feminist ecological perspective, the Biden Harris administration would need to, I'm biased, obviously focus on the feminist agenda for a Green New Deal because black uh, feminists are involved in that collective, um, particularly even from the Gulf South. We see the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy is a co founding organization. Also, I would say focusing on traditional uh, black feminist concerns such as voter suppression, gerrymandering. Um, for, I feel as though when we talk about greening economies, it's often progressive blocks, um, women, people of color, black folk who are who really vote for these progressive policies. So we need to increase obviously their representation in these policymaking um, uh, spaces, environmental decision-making spaces. And that means we have to address voter suppression. Uh, and then also lastly, I would just uh, shout out some black, I would say, feminist and queer uh, leaders who are joining the new administration. We see Shalonda Baker as the new deputy director of energy justice um, at the Department of Energy. So yeah, those are some of my brief thoughts. Um, Francis, do you wanna take this opportunity to say something about the feminist agenda for a Green New Deal? Uh, sure, yeah, the feminist agenda for a Green New Deal is a, um, I would say, eco-feminist policy platform. We have 10 principles on how do we manifest a more equitable uh, and green future? How do we look at care jobs as green jobs? And it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort. It's transnational, even though it's based in the U.S., and also, uh, it's really exciting to see, like I mentioned, folk from the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, but even Jackie um, Patterson with the NAACP who are, who are promoting these principles. And so um, there's a legacy of, of feminist ecological thinkers and practitioners who are involved in some of these transnational spaces. And we're all gonna be lucky to hear from Jackie in our next webinar, Jackie Patterson. Uh, who'd like to go next? Yeah, I, I literally didn't speak because I thought it was a great place to um, for Francis to go ahead and introduce the ideas about the feminist Green New Deal. Um, for me, very briefly, um, I find it really interesting that um, there are two things that are interesting at this current political moment, um, that the former administration, the person who will not be named, um, that there are um, uh, Black women seem to have be the only ones who have created kind of um, uh, legal frameworks to, to demonstrate violation um, of, of, of the way he governed. Um, and we have that from the, um, the prosecutor the DA um, Fannie Wells in Atlanta. And we also have a black woman who is a New York attorney general. So I find that to be really 
poetic <laughs> in many ways that of all of the things that he did that, that we have uh, these particular women and the other case we have in terms of you know we are where we are because of the work of black women in georgia um and the amazing impact of what um stacy um, abrams done um along with others and fair fight um and so black women have always been the backbone for the democratic party um, and we see that. And I think one of the ways that you can um, create a Black feminist agenda, and this would be very hard for politicians to do, is to be able to understand the world not in compartmentalizations, right? In the same way that ecological ecologies is not only about the, 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 built, the environment, um, but also the built environment and about violence, whether it's symbolic, whether it is, whether it's sexual, representational. Um, we don't, um, it doesn't create all of these different categories and slots, it's particularly from an ecological perspective. If the body, whether it's the earth or the society is sick, it requires a number of different interventions. Um, and so that's not the way politicians do things. They put money here, they put money here, they put money here. But it would require the understanding from an ecological perspective that the body is sick and that the body has cumulative, and cumulative effects from a number of processes furthered by capitalism, and that it would take a whole host of remedies that are beyond just one type. It's not just health care. It's not just this over here, but the entire thing, an ecological approach to, to, to solving the problem, because it was an ecological approach that created it. That's a really wonderful comment. Um, what I'm thinking about is work I've been doing lately on enslaved Black mothers and the ways in which they have been aware of their environmental surroundings, been in relationship with the features of the natural world, uh, including inspirited features of the natural world that comes back to that idea of allyship and assistance and help that, that can be there for people who are marginalized and the ways that they have gathered those resources both physical and spiritual, and use those to try to protect their children, to try to protect their families, to try to protect their communities and their people. I'm not a big policy wonk, but I think that starting there with the idea that the aim is looking at what is available, gathering those resources of all types for the purpose of protection that that kind of an idea could transform what, go what governmental you know, leaders would do. And that kind of vision, of course, sees natural features that, are, that seem to be outside of human experience as living beings, as additional living things. So it includes non-humans. And here I want to, to tack on, I shouldn't use that language, I don't want to tack it on. I want to offer for us to, to consider that many of us have already talked about the importance of indigenous people, indigenous lands, indigenous visions, understandings, philosophies, knowledges to African-American understandings and African-American survival. To me, this is a key aspect of Black feminist ecological thought a recognition of the centrality of indigenous peoples and knowledges and lands. And so uh, the Biden-Harris administration is on the right track <laughs> with, you know, with having the first Department of the Interior Secretary who um, is actually a native woman. That's a great start because these histories and these urgencies are of course interrelated. Uh, thank you for all of those wonderful answers. Uh, I think that um, your points really lead right to the question about um, what implications does Black feminist ecological thought have for thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic for thinking about and thinking about recovery from it. Um, on the one hand, I think that um, you know acknowledgement of the ways in which the body is sick, um, not 
from a particular virus, but from the cumulative effect of multiple processes that have been fueled by capitalism and what are the ways in which it left the body so vulnerable and, the bo and particular bodies in particular communities so vulnerable to this virus and its spread. Um, and, and also the ways in which we understand the spread of zoonotic diseases as being a reflection of not seeing non-humans as living things, not paying attention to um, care for the other than human beings and resources of the planet. And so, um, so if you would, um, it would be great if you could reflect a little bit more about the implications for this way of thinking as we think about um, recovery from the pandemic, not simply as getting back to the way things were before, but actually what a meaningful transition into something else could mean. Who'd like to start? I took it very literally, um, your question, um, and it kind of dovetails with what you asked before. I'm, I'm watching with bated breath what happens with this COVID stimulus because it is unlike policy that we've had before. Policy has relied on the notion of trickle down economics. Um, and, um, and so this is the first kind of direct support of, of, of women and families and institutions that have struggled um, under the pandemic. Um, so I'm watching to see um, what real direct support looks like because we haven't done it in a really, really long time um, when we have entered um, recessions or crises in this country. We have thought to bail out businesses um, and capitalists and the idea that that would be the economic driver. And this time we're investing in um, schools and institutions and people um, and poor people in a way that we haven't done before. So I'm really excited about seeing that, um, that play out. So, I guess when I think about the implications um, for a Black feminist ecological thought for this uh, post-pandemic recovery, I think about well, what was what were Black feminist uh, perspectives for economic recovery during the the New Deal, and so then I go back to folks such as Mary McLeod Bethune, who were um, instrumental in lifting up. Uh, the concerns of the Black community, I would say intersectional perspectives through her leading the Black cabinet. And so for me, it's about, it's about leadership and centering the leadership um, so of, of former feminist leaders, uh, our sheroes, and also new folks such as Rihanna Gunwright, who is uh, one of the architects of the, of the Green New Deal. Uh, I think that we need to, Black feminists have always talked about the need for affordable housing, for uh, child care, for, uh, you know, social security. I mean, there's just so many basic types of care and uh, social infrastructure that have been dismantled and challenged um, over time. And so I would say that Black feminist ecological thought, Black feminist thought points to uh, the need to revisit some of these conversations that really we've been having since um, folk of African descent were kidnapped to this country and settler colonialism, and also since reconstruction. So uh, that's my roundabout way of answering the question. But yeah, I think that we need to uh, think about return to our maybe our history books and then see how Black feminist thinkers have thought about recovery um, and then extrapolate that to the future. Thank you. Kaya. Well, in many ways, the pandemic has been not just a terrible illness that has taken so many lives and sickened so many people, damaged so many families, livelihoods, and communities, 
but it's also been a symptom of many other kinds of sicknesses and weaknesses in our society and in global society. So it has held up a mirror so that we can see ourselves. And I don't think that those of us sitting around this virtual table are surprised at what that mirror has reflected. Because Black feminist thinkers have been saying and writing for decades and even centuries that the people who are the most marginalized need to be the ones around whom policy is shaped. They are the ones who are going to feel trouble first and be hit you know, the, the worst by any kind of either planned and purposeful or um, unexpected and, um, and uncontrollable disaster. And we've seen that with COVID. I think about uh, the Kabayi River Collective Statement, which doesn't talk about environment. We've already talked about that today. You know, we started off talking about that, right? Which isn't explicitly about environment, but of course, um, the women who wrote that statement were inspired by Harriet Tubman and her work on um, the Cumbie River. And so I think of it as a, an environmental reflection, even though it's not stated as such. And that is a set of ideas that points this, this out, that we have to think about those who are the most marginalized. And if we do, we will help everyone in society. If we don't, we will see what we have been seeing, and that is those who are already not receiving the health care that they that they deserved, who were already having to, to work jobs that were putting them in difficult positions and making them exposed to uh, environmental threats, who were already impoverished, who were already facing racism, racial discrimination, were the ones that are the ones who are hit the hardest. Um. Thank you. I think that one of the really um, interesting, um, maybe hopeful things to think about, although I'm not actually too optimistic about this, is that one of the things that the pandemic has done or could do if, um, if the idea were articulated publicly enough, perhaps, and valued enough, is change is flip that you know flip that script and and flip that understanding from you help the you center policies around the most marginalized not be not out of charity or some kind of virtue but you do it because this is actually well and not just because it helps you but because this is actually what the central value of our political system, our economic system, our social system needs to be. That it's not about sort of a side dish to the goal of our, our economy is exploitation of people and resources. And then by the way, we help the most vulnerable, you know, because we have to on the side, but that this is actually how we reorient the entire society um, because it's a, better, it's a better value. It's a better goal. It's a better vision. Um, and, um, it feels like so many black feminist thinkers have been critical in articulating it, and, and indigenous thinkers have been in, uh, critical in articulating um, the, you know, the deeply complexly positive aspects of that rather than just seeing it as a, you know, yeah, you do this because you're liberal or something like that. Um, as, as, as it is frequently, I think, devalued in political discourse. Um, so that does bring us to the last question, which is um, what would it mean to center black feminist ecological thought in the context of working for global justice and global peace, moving us outside of, of strictly US national policy now and trying to think about it writ large as we think about the major um, historical dynamics of you know, 500 years of colonialism and capitalism, how do you bring black feminist ecological thought into a transformation that would lead to more justice and more peace at a global level? So, 
Yeah, so I think it's about, I think we've covered, we've covered the idea of, of being transnational. I think we've covered the idea of being diasporic, uh, intersectional. I think I would wanna focus on the healing justice um, aspect of this uh, of global peace, this transition, uh, or I said for me, a gender just transition. I think that uh, justice is a journey and, it, and peace is a journey and it's contradictory and it's messy. And there's a need for the centering of healing because as they say, hurt people hurt people. And so I think that feminist ecological thinkers would say that our, our future will not actually bring about the just and peaceful outcomes we want if we don't actually address uh, eco-anxiety, if we don't address the need for emotional resiliency, if we just don't address uh, intergenerational cumulative and layered trauma. And so I think, yeah, I think in our, in our, in our desire for peace and, and justice and love, we really have to focus on um, healing from trauma. That is well. That is well put. I, I can't. I can't add any more. I think the healing justice is important, and then also the idea of um, been talking about anti-racism, and and that you have to break the notion if you're going to be anti-racist white ally. The idea of being nicest to go out the window, um, and so the idea of the you no know, the the idea of being nice. Black feminist epistemologies allow you to say that there's going to be conflict, like uh, Francis said we don't you we don't we move through it we don't avoid it um conflict sometimes happens because of the emotional historical trauma and we have to work work through it um and being nice and avoiding it is not the way to go and that's what makes it um a journey and a process <laughs> this question is in some ways about how ideas can make a difference in the world and how they can make a difference on um, on a massive scale. And I think that because we are all working at universities, we probably believe that <laughs> that thought matters and um, speaking matters, words matter. And so I think that one of the first steps would be for initiatives to be developed that continue and support the furtherance of Black feminists <laughs> ecological thought so that that work can be um, not only created but also developed in the context of conversations that will challenge it as has just been said so that it can become enriched and so that it can be strengthened and um, the work that needs to be done in multiple fields I mean, we, we can't just have a you know a one-stop shop here <laughs> We have to try to get these ideas out everywhere in lots of different domains and have people who have different skill sets in terms of how they will be engaged in the conversation if we want to have an impact. And I'll add by saying that um, once I heard this comment made, I wish I could remember the speaker so that I could um, give attribution to her. Um, she's a Black woman who I heard at a panel, and she said there are two kinds of power in this world, organized people and organized money. I thought that was just really pithy. And, and so I'll apply that here and say, mm. how is, how is a, a global change possible? The organization of people and the organization of money around these ideas we are discussing. Thank you. That is the perfect sum, I think. Um, so at, at this point, um, I, I think we need to turn to questions from the participants in the audience. Melissa, have you got some curious people out there. We certainly do. And I just want to remind everyone, this is the time to submit your questions if you have them, because we have a bunch coming in. Um, so I think that one of them that I was personally also very interested in, and so I do, uh, I do want to pose it, is to ask um, Francis, but also anyone else who has thoughts on this particular topic, to talk a little bit more about the role of digital storytelling and, um, and to expand a little bit on your kind of comment on how that intersects and is so overlapping with this idea of ecologies in the first place. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I would also love to hear everyone else's thoughts. 
uh, for me, it's about networks. It's about nodes. It's about relationships, which is what ecology really is all about. And I think that it's really interesting to see um, Black women, bl Black women and girls, I should say, with, for example, uh, Black girl environmentalists, intersectional environmentalists, Black women involved in all of these gardening and uh, growing uh, Facebook groups. Just, there's so many different platforms, Instagram. There's so many platforms where uh, Black women and Black feminists are thinking about healing and uh, liberation and fugitivity, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, and, and, uh, and, and crisis. And they're using the uh, digital tools in order to spread awareness um, and reach folk who might be isolated in particular geographies as a result of COVID, but also I would say before COVID. And so it's really exciting to see these, these ideas, um, cross, the cross-pollinization of these ideas. So it's, it's emergent and um, I don't think there's a lot of scholarship um, on, that, on this particular topic, but I would be uh, very interested to see, um, as I mentioned, like folk, it, grow these ideas and support uh, scholars who are interested in these ideas uh, through fellowships and funding. Melissa, I'll speak to that uh, just briefly and say that while I have been involved in mapping projects, I have never done the actual digital programming work to make those happen. Uh, I feel like I have a lot to learn in this area but my bridge into thinking about the digital is through Afrofuturism. And it really is through the work of Jessica Marie Johnson, um, a black feminist historian. And the idea that digital space is so important in our current world is, and is going to become even more important in the future. And so we have to conceptualize that space as an environment and think about what seeds are planted there and think about what is growing there and think about how that space relates to um, our, our exterior felt material natural world. That was the one part that I left out because of time for my Harriet is dope, Harriet Tubman is dope. And talking about her and Afrofuturism, in 2017, there was a comic that was um, kick, through Kickstarter about featuring Harriet Tubman, the Demon Slayer, and how we have reacted our imagination of Harriet Tubman into Afrofuturism. I didn't even get to that, but it's fascinating as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm really glad that that was the piece that connected to the last part that you were, that you were hoping to talk about. Um, okay, so another question that I am seeing is um, just a question that I, I think, again, comes to a little bit of like praxis and what tools are useful um, and, and kind of what angles and what tools are useful. And this is a question about intersections between the paradigms you apply to your scholar activism on the ecological and by extension social justice on one hand and human rights on the other hand and this sort of the utility of human rights frameworks and where and if you see that coming into interaction with black femi feminist ecological thought. Um, and this, you know, again, thinking about regional, uh, international versus regional and domestic. So I don't know if, if either any of you have specific thoughts on that. Um, the, the piece that was mentioned in my introduction, the 2018 piece in environmental sociology was an attempt to try to um, get these manifestos from different groups to figure out how we could come up with an, um, an intersectional uh, or what, we, what we're calling here a Black feminist ecology. Um, and then I used the Cumberbee River statement, Cumberbee River collective statement um, that they wrote to talk about um, black women and centering black women and acknowledging black women as the leaders in environmental justice. Um, I use the uh, principles of environmental justice, which is a very, you look over them, you gloss over them, but it's a very comprehensive understanding of the legacy of colonialism, set of colonialism. It's arguing about reproductive justice. It's really an amazing piece. It, it doesn't touch upon 
gender in ways that I thought were sufficient, particularly Black women. And then finally, ecofeminism, which was largely an anti-nuke movement. And they had a sort of manifesto that arose from a um, the, the, the uh, civil disobedience in blocking the Pentagon. And that piece, while it was written by a number of ecofeminists at the time, had very little um, input by Black and Indigenous women of color. So I took those three things to figure out if we could imagine um, Cumbahee River Collective Statement not having that much environmental part in it, but having a really strong part of why Black women should be um, a part of the liberation struggle. And they say specifically in that piece that the, our liberation is it's tied up in so many um, liberation, right? Um, and then the EJ piece not being very gender specific enough or being in, you know, um, and then the ecofeminist piece not including uh, Black women enough. And through those three things, um, through those ideas, we can come up with something that could encompass uh, what would we call into right now this afternoon, um, this kind of Black feminist ecological perspective. I will will add, but first I want to make sure that Francis is wanting to get in. I had this book a moment ago. Okay. Um, I was going to say I think we need to have big toolkits, but now I think I want to change that to say I think we need to have you know large gardening baskets with lots of different um, tools available to us for studying the questions for making the arguments for translating what it is that we think we're discovering, for talking with people and for listening, for listening to, to what it is that people have themselves studied, researched, understood, shared, and so on. And so I think the human rights framework would function and be productive in certain contexts, especially in um, an international policy kind of context. But the human rights framework has limitations. And one of the first one that this is obvious is that it focuses on the human. I'm all for humans and I want humanity to survive. And I, we, we, want, um, we want dramatic changes in the ways in which we live our lives so that we can protect our children who are alive today and, the, and children who will come in the future. That is what it is all about. And yet the earth is populated by more than just humans. And we have to expand our vision. I think Black feminist ecological thought says this as well and tells us that we need to expand our vision to include everybody and especially the most marginalized. And sometimes it might be a person and sometimes it might be um, another kind of animal. Francis, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think everything's been said very beautifully. And uh, I, I mean, I would just add that in relation to this idea of centering the most marginalized uh, folk and um, non-human species, I think about, uh, I think it was it Loretta, Loretta J. Ross, who um, key figure in the Black Women's Health Movement. She talks about her journey from, you know, being, working on, I guess what folks consider more traditional urban issues to being civil rights, to women rights, to human rights, and how it's all a part of our understanding of justice um, and liberation and abolition. And so, yeah, we just need to have expansive frameworks that include all of these moving pieces um, and understand that, you know, it's all, re, re, she even talks about reproductive justice. So just all, all of it's a part of what we need in order to bring about a more liberatory future. Thank you. Um, okay, so there are like a bunch of other questions and I'd love to kind of get to um, a couple of them, but I'm, so I'm seeing that there's one that is, that kind of comes back to some of these questions of, of structural and economic dimensions of a Green New Deal. Um, and so just wanting to raise this as one possible question for you guys to answer and then maybe I'll add another one in there um, and you can kind of pick and choose what you'd like to answer to. But um, this is a question about how we center Black feminist voices at the front of global economic justice movements and the centering of indigenous 
and intersectional women from the global south, but thinking about these ideas of uh, kind of the policies of austerity and debt and tax injustice that are so central to some of the economic, um, the structural economic issues like that we might see transferring over even within a Green New Deal if it's not done equitably. Um, so that's one question. And then one question that comes from a very different angle um, is a question about feminist perspectives on movement through time and space um, and thinking about kind of, um, I'm gonna try and tie this to sort of the praxis someone asked about in consideration of future, future futurity, sorry, and the praxis of womanist restoration, where and what places do each of you imagine surgeoning to in search of eco ecosystems that that um, support your own journeys? So thinking about kind of where are the places and the ecologies that support you as as activists, as scholars, and then um, and then if that ties into this idea of movement through time and space, that kind of question as well. So those are two very different angles, one on kind of policy, coming back to the, these ideas of economics, and the other one thinking about um, where are the places that you go to in terms of restoration and the environments that make you the strongest. And I'm sorry to put them both on you at once, so you can choose to just answer one and then we can go back around and do the other one, so okay, completely up to you. Okay, so I'll start. I'll try to attack one of those questions. Uh, so in relation to, I guess, the Green New Deal question and a question about austerity, debt, um, and tax justice, I think it's important that we um, lift up the solutions on the ground from frontline individuals. So for example, there was a webinar uh, 2020 uh, with I think COP26 coalition titled A Red, Black and Green New Deal. And they were discussing the need for climate reparations and why that's not like some, uh, you know, this crazy idea for lack of a better, better, better phrase. Uh, there were folks who were talking about the need for rematriation of seeds and, and land and folk who were talking about the need to restructure debt and cancel debt um, as part of our commitment to climate finance and the transfer of knowledge um, and, and ensuring that folk are able to equitably participate in these international climate negotiations. So I guess the short answer is yes, folk on the ground are thinking about how do we, um, from an economic perspective, even feminist economists are thinking about how do we bring about this uh, just and equitable transition? And how do we make sure that we're centering historically uh, marginalized, subaltern, and formerly colonized voices? Thank you. And Keisha or Taya, do either of you either want to speak to that one or speak to this question of the environments or the spaces that you go to in terms of, uh, in terms of I think the phrasing of this was um, ecosystems that support your own heart journeys. I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> that is a work in progress. Um, yeah, that's a work in progress. Uh, but I guess if you can see my enthusiasm about Harriet Tubman and other Shiro's um, and looking at you know, looking at their particular consequences um, and understanding how they were able to 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 move beyond that. Um, other heroes include um, Fannie Lou Hamer and her very agrarian approach to liberty and justice. And so I kind of immerse myself um, in a particular Black women, and it would be and. It would be Harriet Tubman, um, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, and uh, she just escaped me. It's getting it's getting late. It's, she just escaped my mind. Um, but um, that's what I do: kind of immerse myself um, into these biographies, and to recognize that you know I have first world problems. <laughs> um, oh, I know what it is, Claudia. Ugh left of Karl Marx. What's her name? Claudia Jones. Help me out, you know, Claudia Jones. She was um, um, Trinidadian who grew up in New York, who 
who was a Marxist, who was um, exiled, who was deported from the United States and ended up in the UK and ended up literally to the left of Karl Marx. She's buried to the left of Karl Marx. <laughs> Written by Carol Boyce Davies. Well, that, that second question is very interesting. I'm not quite sure what the person means by, by heart, heart journeys. So I guess I, I would articulate a meaning for myself related to that, which would be movement. Oh, I incorporated movement, Melissa. That was one of the questions, right? Uh, movement through space, bringing it all in that seems to result in or is attempting to result in a feeling of rightness, you know, goodness, movement toward uh, the kind of vision that we've been describing. And what I will say here is that I have lived in places where I feel like I'm just skimming the surface of the place. And probably that's often our state of being it seems to me that it feels better and, and closer to good or, or closer to right when I don't just skim the surface of a place, but instead try to get to know the history of the place, in particular, the history of indigenous peoples in the place, in the present, as well as the past, the ways in which indigenous people uh, understand those lands. And it helps me to, to try to walk in places, to enter into the deeper recesses of places, to get a, a feeling, a sense of connectedness to where I am. And I think it, take, it can take quite a long time. I definitely do not feel that right now. I've lived in my, um, my current location for just about three years and that's not long enough. I think to, to get to come even close to knowing a place and to feeling like one's journey can line up with the history and present and future of a place. But I think we do need to do that actually, um, to try to have a sense of, or to try to arrive at a sense of some kind of wholeness, a place from which we can um, try to act as healers in the tradition of Tubman and others that we've been discussing today. Yeah, and I would just add really quickly that in relation to that question, I'm trying to uh, sojourn uh, into myself, lean into my authenticity and take up more space <laughs> uh, as a Black, as a Black woman, as an activist. Uh, also return to Cuba one day. And uh, in terms of thinking about my own genealogies, um, North Carolina, where the chicken and hog farms are, you know, New Jersey, the urban landscapes I was raised in, and also um, Georgia. So, and then I would say uh, I've I've traveled um, internationally, but it would be important for me to travel to some of these countries where my ancestors um, came from, originated. So yeah, that would be really important in terms of a healing journey. Um, my uh, my class, I taught a class in racial residential segregation, and I had an architecture student in um, class, and we talked a lot about memory and restoring memory into spaces and historical markers, and it goes back to my thing about epistemologies and interrogating that, that we have markers of the battle of this was here, um, but we need to infuse our current space with historical markers of moments that are important that get passed by. Um, so that's one of the practical ways of restoring memory um, and, and restoring the presence of things that are critical um, to our evolution as a society, um, critical to confronting our racist past um, that, we, that we gloss over space, but we need to mark it with the memories um, that are embedded in it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so 
Keisha, there's actually another question for you and it, uh, and it has to do with landscapes. And so I'm gonna pose it to you now, but um, kind of more towards when you were presenting, someone asked, oh, make sure to ask, explain further about the notion of fugitive landscapes. Um, Cause I think that was one of the pieces that you had to shorten up in your 10 minutes. So I did wanna turn around and ask if you might talk just a tiny bit further in these last few minutes. Um, about fugitive landscapes. Um, I think Ty, you were also talking about fugitivities as well. So um, you might, yeah. I was talking about it specifically. So the um, the field of Black geographies is such an amazing. Um, of amazing discipline, interdisciplinary approach. And there's a lot of talk about fugitive landscapes and I encourage people um, to engage in some of the literature um, in terms of black geographies. Um, one of the things I did mention, I mentioned Darcita Taylor's um, a piece of, 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 of uplifting Tubman as environmental philosopher. But there's also a 2014 special edition of Meridians that is edited by Janelle Hobson that has a lot of, of contemporary Black feminists talking about the contributions of Tubman to uh, Black feminism and Black feminist thought. So that's something that you might want to look at. But what I was talking about in particular in terms of futures landscapes for Tubman was this idea, and I do a lot of mapping. So this was her, her, the idea of having Dorchester, Maryland, um, as well as Auburn, New York, and St. Catharines, Ontario, that someone, one of the writers from this Meridian's piece talks about Tubman's itinerancy. That movement for her was essential to her master of space and ultimate liberation. That the movement from Dorchester to Auburn, temporarily to St. Catharines and then back to St. Auburn were very important in creating a fugitive landscape. The idea of an underground railroad, of, of you know the, the, the notion of uh, migrations and movements that um, lead to liberation, but are designed to be unseen. Um, so that's what I was talking about. But there's a whole list of literature about fugitive landscapes that is really engaging. So Keisha is talking about the ways in which enslaved people seeking to free themselves, change their lives, help to free others, move through landscapes with a wealth of knowledge that they can apply. To that movement. And, and also she talked about the ways in which certain spaces and places would be attractive to enslaved people seeking freedom because of their positionality on borders. And that's something that I have thought about and, and worked on as well in my research and writing on slavery in Detroit and the ways in which enslaved people were able to use the Detroit River as um, a borderland space that enabled them to try to access freedom actually in both directions because at this time, Canada was not a free space. I think it's also interesting for us to think about the ways in which changes in the environment and especially changes on the ground affected black people's ability to get away, to escape, to make new lives. As uh, monocropping spread, you know, plantation agriculture was um, an early form of monocropping. And as forests were torn down, enslaved people didn't have the same kind of what we might call, you know, wilderness wild spaces to move through. Of course, no space is ever going to be fully wild or in wilderness. Uh, different people thought about those spaces in different ways. Indigenous people would have been familiar with those landscapes. But from the perspective of enslavers, from the perspective of um, plantation centers, those spaces were wild and enslaved people could access them, hide in them, and navigate them. As the landscape was changed, those opportunities shrunk. And I think that's um, important for us to think about with regard to the past, but also with regard to the present and possibilities for reimagination, reinvention, uh, and even protection in our present day political moment. I am so sad to say that our time is just about up. Um, I think what I'd like to do now is turn to 
each one of you to see whether you have a minute of a final thought that you'd like to leave us with. Francis, yeah, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, uh, well, it's been a pleasure to just be a part of this conversation and um, really uh, listen and learn from my brilliant colleagues. Uh, I think that I would just like to echo um, uh, Ty's uh, point about we need to create more spaces for these types of conversations and funding for this type of research. I think that's really important. Um, also, I would say that for me, when I think about Black Films Ecological Thought, uh, I, I'm really, really enthralled with this idea of, of landscapes of desire and also pleasure in relation to healing. And so I would just encourage everyone to, um, as uh, Reverend, Ma Reverend Dr. Melanie Harris once told me, live your best life. Because um, if you take care of yourself, you are taking care of the earth and, um, you know, get involved in feminist collectives. Um, environmental collectives, you know, it's it's really important. We have a lot of issues, but we also have a lot of solutions. Kito, you want to go next? Okay. Um, uh, really quickly, I um, we've talked a little bit about abolition here, and, and um, someone mentioned in the Q and A, what about people like Ruth Gilmore, um, and the work on prison abolition, and even the work of Andrew Davis on abolition. That the issue of abolition and um, the um, and the capturing of black bodies is very much still a work in progress, mm -hmm. um, and liberation is still a work in progress. And so, I uh, want to remind people when we're talking about COVID, um, one of the worst hit are um, prisoners, um, as well as those in nursing homes. And so, this um, this project of abolition, this project of liberation, is still ongoing um, in many ways. I am also grateful for the conversation, for all of the ideas. I feel so inspired. Um, I want to go think more and talk more. I hope we have the opportunity to do that. A couple of final thoughts that I have are that we should try to continue the work of restoring, restoring um, what it means to be human, what it means to be um, American, what it means to be people living in our local communities and spaces. And I'm, I'm borrowing this idea from the Potawatomi botanist and writer Robin Wall Kimmerer, who talks a lot about the importance of narrative and how narrative has partly been what has gotten us into this fix. We have the wrong story about the earth and our relationship to it. We need to remake and redo that story. And a second idea that I'd like to close with is that I think that Black women in conjunction with Indigenous women who are the original rulers of the land need to get a hold of more land. Mm -hmm. And this is a materialist point, I know, but I think that's important to try to have um, these spaces of fugitivity, to try to remake these spaces and to hold on to them. And so I would love to see somebody fund some workshops. <laughs> They're probably already happening, but maybe fund more workshops around how can Black communities, Black women, Black feminist um, environmentalists and eco-womanists, Indigenous women, learn more practical tools and be supported in, in, um, in gaining and maintaining and living in good positive relationship with collective land. Thank you so much. Well, this has been um, such a rich and generative and inspiring conversation. I, um, I want to thank our speakers, not only for the power and brilliance of your thinking, but also for your labor and time in preparing for this webinar and the time you've spent with us and your attentive engagement with each other and with the questions of our participants. Um, you know, you've not only given us so much to think about, but really some, I think some critically important ideas for ways to move forward. I hope there were some funders listening because there were some particularly great ones that could um, use some support. Um, 
we and and this would be the point where if we weren't on zoom there would be thunderous applause from the audience for all of you so please um please hear it in your minds even if um even if you can't hear it um orally um in for the for all of the participants who came thank you so much we know that some of you will want to listen again and that you'll want to tell your friends about it and there will be a recording on our website um, where you can do just that. I'll also say that although this is not the scale of space that people were talking about needing, that there will be space to continue this conversation in our next webinar, which will be on April 1st on gender, race, and climate justice, national and, poli and global policy perspectives. And we have four more brilliant women who will be participating. Colette Pichon Battle, um, Osprey Oriel Lake, Anita Nayar and Jacqueline Patterson. So we hope that you will join us for that and continue along these lines. Um, so once again, thank you to everybody and um, especially our speakers. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye bye.